Hello, 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 hello. I need to wake myself up. So, so far we've done uh, Warsaw, Gdansk, and we're now here. It's uh, the Great Poland Tour of 2016. Yes. So, yeah, so I want to talk to you today about VR and Unity. And I just want to talk to you a big like, overview of where we are uh, with our VR implementation and show you how to add some interactivity and UI in the editor itself and some of the best practices towards uh, developing the VR. So before we get started, I'd like to know more about you guys. So who's actually developing anything for VR right now? That's pretty good numbers, best I've seen so far. Uh, who's doing it for Oculus? Okay, so the majority. Uh, PSVR? None. Uh, Vive? None. One, One, two, two. Uh, yes, Gear VR. Yep, Gear VR and mobile. Okay, and uh, anybody using like the Google Cardboard SDK? Okay, so you all laugh, but that's what I'm going to show you today. Because I think that's the most accessible. So maybe what, 20 people put their hands up here, and the rest probably don't have access to VR devices or. Uh, yeah, devices or uh, stuff like that. So. I love teaching the Google Cardboard SDK. Uh, it's going to be native soon in Unity, so it's just the more accessible one for teaching. Uh, cool. Anyway, who's who's programmers? Okay, artists. Okay, uh, QA. That should be everybody because you told us to own games. Uh, audio guys. Very important here. Cool. Uh, good. So, this is me, kind of. <laughs> uh, so I'm from the north of England. Uh, so a lot of my colleagues like to say that I have a, a lot of wildling friends. That I know nothing, and they call me John Snow. Uh, so yeah. So I'm a technical evangelist for Unity, and it's my job to come visit you guys all around Europe and the Middle East help Unity developers create their games, uh, do training, write technical blog posts, and show and share new features in the engine. So that's my Twitter, that's my email if you guys want to contact me. I reply much quicker to Twitter than to, uh, to email, as some of you guys already know in the audience. Uh, but yeah, so feel free to shoot me a message. So yeah, so we love VR at Unity. Uh, Everybody's like super excited when we get new headsets shipped to the office and VR developers love Unity. So something like 90% of mobile VR content is made with Unity and about 70% uh, of uh, I guess proper HMDs uh, made with Unity. So that's a lot of, of developers and uh, the main reason for our success is for the amount of platforms that we support. Cool. So. We spotted the Oculus uh, from very, very early uh, with our plugin. Uh, now it's native, been so for maybe about nine months, which is pretty awesome. And we're going to be uh, supporting that for the foreseeable future. Uh, the Gear VR, we also spot that natively now. And, like, this is the future right here, just people walking around with massive eyes, like the lady down, who was down here with on her head. Uh, PlayStation VR, so again, this is uh, native. And HoloLens, so we're the only middleware right now that supports HoloLens development. You can do it in native DirectX 12, uh, but I don't see why you'd want to do that. And we've just announced, uh, and this will be going into 5.4 beta, uh, the Vive support as well. So again, all these platforms, all native, all the same APIs, uh, cross-platform, it's pretty great. And lots and lots of different cardboard and plastic and other kind of headsets and that's what I want to talk to you today about the Google Cardboard SDK and the accessibility that we can bring as developers uh, giving it to everybody cool so it's 2016 yeah it's the year of VR woohoo <laughs> so a lot of people are convinced <laughs> uh, so yeah so it's kind of my job and you guys' jobs as developers to make awesome content which will make consumers, like our grandmas, go out and buy a headset so they can look around a nice pretty garden or go on a roller coaster. So yeah, so you guys as developers can shape the future. 
Uh, the only reason I go out and buy the newest Game Boy every time is because I want to play Pokemon. That's the only reason. So somebody's going to make an amazing game and think, hey, I'm going to buy a headset because I want to play that amazing game. Uh, the only reason I wanted a Vive was to play a fantastic contraption, and it's like the best game ever. The Vive's amazing. Anyone who's tried it, uh, or if you haven't tried it, make sure you can. I'll try to. So yeah, so this is what I'm here to tell you. <laughs> Please, please, please be nice to your players. If this was this guy's first experience in VR, you try and mess around with him, he's never going to come back. So you imagine giving a really crazy roller coaster demo to a 10 year old little kid or your 90 year old grandma, they're never going to try a virtual reality experience again because you've messed them around the first time. So yeah, so please, please be nice. We're developers. We spend hours with the head mount and display on. We put it on, change things. Uh, well, we take it off, change things, put it back on, and we keep changing and take it on and off all day long. So we learn to ignore the crazy. We're used to, we know that it's not real. We kind of gain our VR legs. I like our C legs, but in VR. So we're not expecting it to be real. We're not trying to feel immersed. We're just developing. We're just uh, making something. It's like when you make a game really hard by accident because you're just testing it all the time and you get really good at it. It's the same kind of thing. So yeah, players are fresh, young, innocent brains and they want to feel immersed. They don't want it to be really crazy and wacky. So don't traumatise them too early. Uh, just a proof, <coughs> VR legs is in the Urban Dictionary. So it's a real term. I didn't just make it up. Cool. So I want to talk about interactivity now. Uh, so the main things I love to talk about is interactivity and UI and adapting our games or making new games uh, that suit a virtual reality experience. So loads of people come to me and say, hey I've got this game, it's been out for like a year on PC, I'm going to adapt it for VR. I'll just uh, put it onto a headset and make it run, it'll be fine. And that's like the worst thing you can do because so many things need to change. Uh, the way that you interact, the way that the UI is in the world, and that's a big no-no. So I've got various different inputs right now, and some of them are great to use, like the Leap Motion, it's really cool, or the Move Controllers, like the Vive or the PlayStation, uh, they're really good, but I love to kind of go for the most common, like, lowest denominator. So the thing that every single VR device can do, and the most simplest form of input. Again, which is why I really love Google Cardboard. So I love making gaze focused games with one touch input. That's all you need, you need to move around and you need to click this little button here and that counts as one <coughs> touch. Okay, so I want to build up a scene right now and show you two different ways to use the Google Cardboard SDK really quickly to get some interactivity going. So we also like to see how many times Unity crashes in every one of my demos. It crashed about six times while I was making this, and then it's not crashed for the previous two nights, so here's hoping. And also to stop you guys moaning, I always use the light editor. <laughs> I think it looks much better anyway. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to bring in the Google Cardboard SDK. So you can just get this for free on the Google website. And with it comes some prefabs, pre made for us, and various scripts. And the one we're going to use today, which is the best one, it's the most easy to set up, is Cardboard Main. And on there it's got some various settings. Uh, first thing it does is it enables VR mode in Unity uh, from this prefab. So normally we'd have to go into player settings, go on virtual reality supported. Uh, but this just did it straight for us. Woohoo. Uh, distortion correction. So this is currently tipped as Unity, but I like to turn it off because it does some funky stuff and I don't think it looks as good and it's much harder to read text. Uh, it's got some stuff like UI layering settings and buttons and triggers and also some emulation settings saying 
what's your screen size and what device type you're going for. But they're pretty good as standard. So I'm going to bring it into my game now. And I'm going to go and remove this horrible blue colour that we all know from Unity 4. And have the nice skybox. Okay. And I'm just going to bring in some models too. Just build up a world. Is that crash? Okay. So the first thing people just do not understand is making sure that you are the right height in your virtual reality experience. So normally in a first person like shooter game, it's not an issue. You can look down and if you're ten foot tall or twenty foot tall, it doesn't really matter how tall you are because you're not feeling that motion sickness, you're not feeling actually I'm stood up, I know how tall I am, I can look down at the floor and, and know the difference. But a lot of people uh, get very, very like motion sick by having different heights, so allowing the player to input their height or knowing how high the player is is really good. So I know that I am 5 foot 11, uh, like about 180 centimeters or so. So every one unit in Unity counts as one meter. So I'm going to grab my headset and I'm going to put it 1.8 in the world. And make it look a little bit better, the lighting. There we go. I'm going to make this so nobody can escape. <coughs> so straight away I can press play. And like I said, this distortion that happens is not very nice looking. So I'm going to take it off. And just have it as no. Okay. And now I can hold Alt. Uh, the Google Cardboard SDK allows me to look around with my mouse and use my click as input. So I'm in the well now. I can look around. If we built this, not much to see. So I'm going to add some objects. Going to add in something to interact with. So I'm going to add in a balloon. Okay, and nothing has textures on, it looks really bad, so I'm going to mix the textures. Nice pink balloon. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is some sort of visual feedback. So we know we need to look at the balloon and think, is this an interactable object? Uh, can we click on it to interact? Uh, instead of like, when we play... Uh, point and click games. How many people have been stuck on a point and click game and clicked on every single pixel of the screen trying to figure out what they can click on or interact with? It's really, really annoying. And it's going to be really annoying for the player to look around and think, can I click with this? Can I interact with this? Can I interact with this? So we're going to create some, some sort of visual feedback to say, hey, when you look at this, it changes colour. We know that we can interact. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is grab my blue and I need to do some sort of scripts, I need to some sort of event in the event system. So I'm going to create, go on my UI and create an event system. Okay, <coughs> and we have our standalone input module. And this is, is our like, input system for up, down, left, right, or our keyboard. We don't need that anymore, we need gears and we need touch input. Because that's what the Google Cardboard SDK requires. So I'm going to remove this. I'm going to add in... Gears input module, which is part of the Google Cardboard SDK, and touch input module. So it's really important to get these two the correct way around because I spent about two hours uh, the other week trying to figure out why my touch wasn't working, and I realised that it was overriding each other. So make sure it's that way around. Okay, and I've got some pre-prepared scripts because I don't fancy coding in front of everyone. <coughs> I'll still show you what they look like. And what I wanted to do was make the most generic interactivity scripts that I could possibly could, so I can add it on all different objects further down the line. So I've got my balloon, and first thing I need to do is add a collider to it. So I'm just going to add a mesh collider, because that's how the event system uh, works. And I've got a script called interact script. 
Um, all this is saying is, hey, look at the event system. Use this function saying set gears at. So if I look at the object, it's going to change the color. As soon as I look away from the object, it's going to say, uh, yep, you're done. Change back to its original color. So I'm going to have a highlight color, so like blue. Cool. And then what I need to do is uh, connect my event system. So I'm going to put in an event trigger component. And what I need is on point enter, on point exit, and point to click because they're the ones that the Google Cardboard event system requires. So I've got point to enter, point to exit, and point to click. And this is kind of like the UI system, so I just need to drag in the objects what I require to, to use the script off. So I'm just pulling in itself. Um, before we go any further, and before Unity crashes, I'm going to save the scene. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to use the event interact script and say, hey, set gears that, click ball, same for that, but then turn it off. Okay, and then the very last step is, for some reason it's not actually on the prefab when you import the Google Cardboard, is on the main camera, uh, we need to add in a physics raycaster. And that's what makes everything work. And then you can also set the event mask, so you can say, hey, Anything that's interactable, we can say, oh, there, uh, this is the, the layer. But we don't need to do that right now. Cool. So hopefully, 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 when we look at the balloon, yay, where did it go? It changes colour. So then we know that, hey, this is an interactable object. So if I was in the 3D world now, and in VR experience now, I'd be looking around and look at this bottle, it would change colour, but hey, I know I can interact with this, rather than everything not changing and just clicking on everything to try to figure out. Cool, so you kind of see how easy and quickly you can do that and get something running. So even if you're an artist and want something uh, just to set out a world, you can do that really quickly. Uh, but you saw how hard it was for me to try to figure out where the central point of where I was looking. So again, we need some sort of indicator to say, hey, you're looking in this direction. So we need a central point, a rectangle, uh, like we do in most games. Again, it's really easy to set up in the Google Cardboard SD kit. And it's pre-made for us. So we've got... Excuse me, I have yep. a question. Is it possible to test this if you've got your own cardboard with you need your remote? Uh, yes, but Unity Remote's pretty shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm asking. <laughs> there is a Trinus VR. Uh, you can play it uh, on Google Cardboard. Yeah. Uh, you can play it on Google Cardboard. Yeah. You can play it on Google Cardboard. Yeah. You can play it on Google Cardboard. Yeah. You can play it on Google uh, so yeah, so in our uh, Cardboard SDK and prefabs under UI, we've got pre-made Cardboard Rectical uh, and we're going to put it on our main on our yeah, main camera. Okay, uh, we're just going to set the colour to be something so we can see it. Okay, so we can see that in the centre of our screen now. We're going to move around so we can look at our balloon straight away. And hey, because it's linked to the event system, it gets bigger. So again, some sort of visual feedback to say, we know that we can interact with this object. So it's just all about like, giving that player some sort of feedback and not just clicking everywhere in the world. <coughs> So that's kind of like the very, very basic, looking through where the player is, and they're saying uh, it's a first person view, which near enough every single VR experience is. But uh, I kind of love the idea of, instead of being you're that first person in the VR experience, thinking of kind of abstracting where you are and being some sort of God view. So I was doing a game jam recently where I 
thought of that idea and thought, hey, what if I'm not the player in the game? What if I'm some sort of god looking and can affect different things? So my theme was dinosaurs and aliens. So I decided to make a game uh, kind of like when you have a laser and you're pointing it for cats, so they chase it around. I wanted to make a game where you're an alien and you point a laser for dinosaurs, lead them into a big beam and shoot them up and steal them from the world. So that's why the dinosaurs became extinct. True story. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to bring in my really cute dinosaur, which you all can be jealous of and ask me for after. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. So we're going to do a thing where we look around the world and the dinosaur will follow to that point. Here he is. We want it. <laughs> <laughs> He's even got a really cute little walk as well. Look at his little wiggly tail. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to bring him into the world, move him around, Whoop. make him pink as well maybe, yay! Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to create a nav mesh, we need to make him a nav mesh agent and we need to say wherever we are looking in the world, dinosaur wants to move to that position. Okay, so I've got my triceratops here. I'm going to get make him a nav mesh agent. I'm going to grab my landscape and say, we want to make this navigation static and make it a walkable area. We're going to bake and it's going to look horrible. Let me move this down. Okay, so we're just going to say, oops. This is the area where the dinosaur can move around. It's really quick. We're just doing it for like prototyping sake. Um, we're also going to say we need a script on here called uh, Flow Navigation Scripts. Again, something I wrote earlier on. This is just basically saying uh, grab the agent dinosaur. If it's active and enabled, look from the central point of my screen and uh, shoot a raycast. If it hits something, make that the hit point and move to that position. Really, really quick and really easy. And I'm going to give this Dino Navigation Scripts. This one's even simpler. Just saying set the destination, what the point of position is. And pass in dinosaur to here. Great. Uh, I think that's it. Let's see. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, attack me instead. So I need to add on a mesh collider onto here. <clears throat> Yay. So it's thinking about new ways of being that person in the experience and interacting with the world. So you don't need to be that first person view that's in all the action. You can be that god view, you can make guns shoot into where you're looking. Or you... So yeah, you could do a, a tower defence game, wherever you look, the guns shoot there. Or the missiles, or the bazookas, or you can make a game where you're an alien and you're trying to steal dinosaurs from the world. Really, really quick and really, really easy to do. Cool. So the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is UI. So if we look at an ordinary game, uh, we see we've got our like inventory here, we've got our map, got our menu system, our chat system. That is a lot of information all on one screen, but we're kind of used to that. But no matter how cool this guy looks, that's information overload, and you're not going to be able to move your eyes to see every every bit, single bit of that information all at the same time. And it's going to cause a lot of distraction to your gameplay. And that is now we see the world. We don't walk around with like UI on our eyes saying well, our current health or if we need food or if we need sleep like The Sims. 
we actually see something, walk up to it. So I can walk up to this board here and look at it. I can choose not to look at it. So a lot of things, a lot of UI and VR, you actually, the player doesn't have to choose to look at it. They can look away. You can maybe add sounds or some sort of uh, notification saying, hey, look this way. But at the end of the day, if the player does not want to look, they don't have to. Oh. So yes, yeah, so this is a really good example of UI in the world space. So people can look around and see the rest of the world, but they've still got this thing in front of them. They can look here for extras, they can look at the start level to actually start and click when they want to. And we did this with our VR sample assets as well. So every single uh, picture here is like a curved mesh with a GIF on it. Uh, that we like form into an animation, but it's all curved towards a player, but it's all in world space. So you can stand in the middle of the room and see it curving around, all focusing on you. Kind of like this example, kind of like a bit like Minority Report. Uh, everything is in the world to interact with. And then it's also really key about thinking about the player. So on this really early Oculus demo here, uh, it says, what's your current position? Are you sitting or are you standing? Going back to the height of the player, if you're sitting down really low, but it looks like you're standing up, again, it can cause a lot of uh, motion sickness and confusion and disorientation of the player. Uh, games like, like this, like uh, Elite Dangerous, uh, cockpit games have done very well because... You can still move the player, but they are stuck to that boundary, so they don't feel emotion sickness. If you move the player by themselves without any of uh, the cockpit around them, they would, again, feel motion sickness. And this game, Pamela, which is actually not a VR game, but it's really good use of world space UI. So you imagine having one of the, like, the Vive controllers, you move it across, and you can see all your UI on your arm. It adds to that immersion, rather than just seeing it on your face, it's actually in the world. And Dead Space did this quite some time ago with uh, like the the back thing here showing the health and like the status. It really, really adds to to that merge. You have to keep looking around for different UI. And Tilt Brush uh, for for the Vive is amazing as well. So you have your various different uh, your handles here, and you've got your UI on these. So I can say I want to use this brush and this colour. This one is my actual brush, I can start painting and then point it to change the colour and click and it works really nicely. And like I said and keep saying, every single person is different. So just be wary of that. So I'm going to show you how to create some UI now. So the first thing that everybody does is create a canvas, create a panel and it's in your face straight away over everything all right that's exactly what we don't want is when we press play it doubles and it looks terrible let me say it puts a button on it as well or So put that there, press play. And you can see it's really hard, you can't even point to it because the button's actually on our face. It's not going to be good. So what we need to do is go on canvas and instead of screen space, we need to change that to world space. And what a lot of people do when they're creating UI is they change this width and height value. And that's actually the pixels of the canvas, which we don't need to change. We can't make that like 20 by 20 because we won't fit any text on there. We just need to use the scaling tool. So I'm going to say like 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. It's really annoying to do. It should be a lot better, but that's the current way it has to be because somebody decided that a long time ago. Okay, so we've got that in our world now. And it looks like it's directly on the camera, so I'll move it over. Got canvas there, our panel. 
Now when we press on here, we're actually pointing to the right one. So we can actually board right in front of us. And what we can also see is because this is also linked to the event system, when I look at it, it will say that hey, this is an interactable object. When I look away, it will stop. Okay. What I'm going to do is turn off my graphics raycaster on my uh, canvas, and I'm only going to give it objects that I actually want to interact with. So I'm going to put a button back in. Same here, when I make this bigger, shove it over here. And I forgot to put a graphics raycaster on it. Ah! I don't know what's going on there. But yeah, so straight away, again, this is linked to the event system. So I can click and it will give feedback. So if I've got the Google Cardboard headset on, all I need to do is swipe down on the, the magnet or the tap thing. Straight away we can click this button and do something through the button event system. So I can go to my on click and say, hey, I want to pass in itself. Give it its game object, set active, and it's going to make it false. That is terrifying. So yeah, we can see we clicked on the button. And um, we could do the exact same for the balloon, which I forgot to show you earlier on, but I'm going to show you really quickly now. So I've got the balloon, and like with the point to click event, we can pass in itself, turn itself off. So now when I look up at the balloon, when the dinosaur's not going crazy, I can just click that, and it's all linked through the event system. So the biggest thing as well is reading text uh, on UI and when you do it right, a lot of people uh, have said like how amazed the Google Cardboard, like how you can read it through the Google Cardboard so well because we've seen really bad examples on the Play Store or people just making really, really quick prototypes but getting text right is really, really key. So my panel now, I'm going to create some text and like say, Hello. Pause. Nah, 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 nah. Not that one. <laughs> Make it a bit bigger. That's really small. Uh, we're not going to use a red background because that sucks. What we're going to use is kind of like an off-white but transparent. So even just like the slightest bit of uh, background like this really helps with the clarity of the text. And also I found not giving it a full black colour, so having it kind of like an off black or a grey or a very dark blue gives it a lot better uh, clarity. And finally in our canvas scaler here, this uh, uh, this value uh, is called dynamic pixels per unit and if we change this to between 5 and 10 it makes our text a whole lot crisper. So I'm going to say like it changes to 8. So if you look at the text, I'll change it from 1 to 8. Uh, it just makes it look a whole lot crisper and easy to view uh, with the card bottom. So now I've got lots of crazy things happening with a dinosaur running out of face. Bloom we can pop. Where is that going? I have no idea. And a button we can select. And the main thing I like to stress again is giving the player that choice. So give them the option to move the text closer. So if this is like our menu that has different things on and it changes. Go into our options saying, hey, let me choose how close that menu text is. So a lot of people, uh, the most comfortable ranges are between 5 and 10 units in front of you. Uh, with kind of like a medium about 7 is pretty good. But everybody's eyesight is different, so allow them to change the focus or the, the distance uh, of the UI between you. 
It's just really, really simple, but it gives the player that feeling that you actually care about them. Because uh, everybody is different. Cool. Uh, <coughs> next, what I want to do is not open my browser, I just did. Uh, is this example here is really good for one touch games uh, if you've got even just one form of input. But what if it's a gears only focused game and you want to create a UI for this? So what I'm going to do is create a slider now, and if you look at the slider, it starts filling up. As soon as you look away, it goes back down. Once it fills up, it does something. Kind of like how the connect was when you like put your hand over some UI and it filled up like a, a circle, and when it was full, it did something. So I want to create... It's not in there. Uh... Gears UI, and in here I'm going to create a slider. I'm going to remove the handle. And I'll change that color so it's a bit better. Okay. Uh, did I put it on here? I think I did. So I've just got a UI gear script, which is near enough the exact same as the interact script, saying uh, when I look at the objects, set gears that, make it a ball, every update just increase the value of the slider when it's full, saying send a debug message called slider full. And what I also want to do is make sure I add on a, a mesh collider onto this. Because again, we need a collider for our objects. Uh, we need to add on a graphics rear cluster. Actually, that's wrong. It's not a mesh collider because it's UI. And we need to add on our event triggers, just like we did before. Point to enter, point to exit. And then we're going to pass in itself because it needs to access the UI gear script. Here we go. Uh, we need to say, hey, set gears that. And the same again. Now, when we look at this, we've got the dinosaur running out of our face. It starts to fill up. And then when it's full, it sends me a debug message called full. When we look away, we can do different things. So that's if you just really want to make a game that's. Uh, gears focused altogether and no form of input. What to do is look and it fills up. Cool. So that is how to make really, really basic UI working. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is moving the player in VR. So I don't have an example for this to make, but I'm going to show you things I've been working on. So this is kind of using the same things that I've done so far today. Uh, this is a Unity Masterclass, so we're going to be travelling around Europe uh, doing different training days and teaching people and doing a follow-along session where they can uh, make, these, make these demos. So the first thing we've got is our, our system here, our menu system, which I kind of created earlier on. And got input and first thing people say is when they're kind of like trying to make a, a game is uh, how do they do menu systems? How is the player supposed to find a menu? Uh, the very the best and basic way that I could find is just by saying hey look up and a menu appears there so that no longer like looking for things in the world just saying look up and you can then go forwards or backwards and if you want to teleport through uh, here's our portals demo. So plenty of people try and teleport with their games. Uh, I don't necessarily like that technique that much because it causes a lot of disorientation with the player. So they'll maybe look at that wall over there and saying, how hey, I want to teleport there. And then they'll teleport and they'll end up facing the wall like this. And then they don't know where they are. Uh, they're really confused. Whereas, and they, get, they, they, don't get to, they don't get to see the world that they're passing through. With portals, however, you can look into uh, the distance, click where you want to go, and you can move the player 
uh, at constant rate, so don't use uh, acceleration or deacceleration, just keep it at constant uh, pace, and move into that position. So that's got like various advantages with the player actually gets to see the world that they're walking through. They know they're moving to the position because they clicked, hey, I want to move that to that position. And then they don't feel disorientated when they just appear at that position. They actually move to it. So again, I made these examples where you can look it up into the distance. You can see that's an interactable object. You click it and you move to it at a constant pace. And then go back to the beginning. So I just find this method a lot nicer for especially new players. I guess people who are used to VR, that they're okay with teleportation, but newer players actually like to move around the world and have that control of, hey, I want to see that place over there, I click it, I want to move at a nice constant pace. Cool. And the last thing I want to show is uh, transitions. So when people, either if they do use teleportation or if they're changing from one scene to another, in a traditional game, they'll just be like, hey, I'm here, flick, suite, flick uh, scenes, and we're here now. It doesn't matter uh, because it doesn't affect people <coughs> in the way it does in VR. So I want to re really, really quickly show you how to make a quick transition animation uh, using a panel and the animation system. So I'm going to create new game objects. Transition, uh, canvas, and a panel. Whoops. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Uh, I'm going to set the alpha to zero, and I'm going to create an animation now, which uh, changes it all the way to one and back down again. So I'm just going to create an animation clip, call it trans. Uh, I've got a keyframe here, and you can see we're recording. Okay, and then after say here, I'm going to make it to be one, and then I'm just going to copy and paste that keyframe from the first frame. Bang. So now we've just got a really nice transition where we can do the scene switching or we can change the UI or we can move the player completely uh, while this transition is happening. Okay, and create an animation controller. Oh, we've created one for us, it's called transition. Uh, I'm going to create an empty state and have a trigger to click this off. Uh, we're going to make this the default. We'll just create a trigger called Go. And we're not going to have an exit time because that will be annoying. Okay, and now what we're going to do is because all the event system uh, works together, we can take transition. I'm going to stop recording because I'll probably do something bad and click on our button. So when we click on this button now, we can kick off that transition. I hope this works. Ah, uh, dinosaur move. That's because uh, I forgot to remove the graphics raycaster on my full panel. Okay, I'm going to click button. Now, transition works. Really, really quick, really, really easy, but it really does uh, make it a lot more pleasant for people <coughs> actually in the experience, especially if you're going to move them around or teleport them or switch scenes. Great. So, yes, everybody is different. Don't just test on your friends. So if I tested my VR game on everybody in this room, everybody's developers, we already gathered that 20 to 30 of them are already developing VR experiences, so they're going to be used to it. 
Uh, they're going to like certain types of games, I guess. Uh, so give it to as many people as possible. Get that feedback, see how they play, and then give them and say, what are you actually looking at now? What do you see? What do you want to do? What, what are your expectations of the world? Yeah, and like I said, uh, transitions are pretty good. So perfection is ridiculously hard when making uh, VR experiences. So ideally we have to hit 75, well no, we have to hit 75, ideally 90, uh, if you're targeting like Oculus 5 and stuff. Uh, mobile at 60, because that's kind of the maximum we can do. Uh, dropped frame rates are really not worth better graphics. So people always, like, they're always coming to me and saying, hey we've got this hyper realistic uh, assets and we put them, want to put them in VR, it's going to be amazing, it's going to be so lifelike. And I'm like, we are in life, we are in real life. Make something that transports people to another world. Why does it have to be what we can do already? So yeah, so that's why I really love like low poly and like create crazy, crazy cartoon ideas. Uh, use level of detail, colouring and batching, because remember it's two cameras. Uh, check out the Oculus Guide and the Unity VR samples for best practices. And please, please, please test on an actual minimum spec device. How many people have just tested on their brand new iPhone or their brand new iPads or the latest Android with like quad core, four gig, uh, like dedicated graphics card in their, their phone, which is crazy. Not everybody has these devices. So generally when I'm uh, making like a Google Cardboard game, I'm testing on a Galaxy S3, uh, an S5, and then uh, my phone, which is a OnePlus 2, which is one of the latest ones. But that just gives you an idea of what actually works. Because uh, a lot of people who are actually going to download it off like the Play Store or anywhere else, they're not going to have the very latest phones. And then they're going to give you a bad review and say it's shit, and you're going to get people saying they feel ill from it. So just test them as much as you can. Uh, don't use the standard shader, it runs terribly on mobile. Use Unity's mobile uh, shader system. Uh, sh shaders here. Yeah. Uh, make sure we bake our lights. Uh, I know a lot of people are having trouble with Enlighten, uh, with light mapping. Uh, it's a big, big problem for us. Uh, we're addressing this. So we're working with Imagination Technologies on a new light mapping system uh, just for, for baked light maps. Uh, and this is called the Progressive Light Mapper. Uh, this is a way to iteratively bake the light maps at uh, different textures, kind of like every iteration. So I've got my scene here, and I say, hey, I want to bake this into a light map. It will bake at like 64, it will bake at uh, 128, 256, and I can't remember the other powers of two, and eventually it will get to the texture size you want, like 1024. Uh, and it will do it iteratively so you can see it working. If it's not right for you, you can move your object and it'll start again. Uh, not like what it currently is, it just tries to do it in one big bake. Uh, light probes, really good. Uh, check out the overdraw, you can actually see it in the Unity editor when you flick in the scene view. You can enable overdraw. And colliders, try not to use uh, mesh colliders, uh, especially on big worlds or environments. Uh, level of detail, you are in this one spot, you don't need to look into the very distance and see a ridiculously high res uh, object. You, things around you are meant to be high res, but uh, use Unity's LOD system. Uh, object pooling, so this is one of my like major things that I go on about so much, because nobody does this. Uh, object pooling, if you don't know, is a way of storing lots of things uh, at the beginning of like a game session and then using that pool of objects uh, over again. So if I've got all these badges, instead of creating one and destroying it every single time, create and destroy, create and destroy, that's going to cause uh, a lot of uh, garbage collection. Instead, at the beginning of our game, when the game's loading, we create this pool of them, we use it, it fires, as soon as it's done, we get it again, we put it back into the pool, we use the next one, and it's a really good way of making sure that we uh, optimize nicely. Uh, use sprite packing and texture atlasing. Uh, so Unity's got its own inbuilt sprite packer for 2D. And you can use various different uh, third party ones for textures. 
uh, running calculations every few frames instead of every frame. So you saw my dinosaur example, every single update 60 times a second, that decides it needs to move position. That is so, so bad. So please don't do that in your final builds because like realistically I only need to do that maybe every second or every half a second which saves a ridiculous amount of frames. So try just go through your scripts and see what actually needs to be an update or that can be in a, a method that runs every few seconds instead. And the profiler is your friend. Alright, so the person who said, oh, is, it, is asset bundles in Unity 5? Is that only a pro feature? Everything in Unity 5 except the splash screen and except the dark editor is free <laughs> to use for everyone. So a lot of people who use Unity 4 uh, they didn't understand the profiler because they didn't get to use it. But now it's free to use. Uh, you can use it as many times as you want, and it's really, really good. And Unity 5.4 is currently in open beta for everybody to download. But we're using a lot of uh, new rendering techniques and optimization for VR. So there's a thing called double wide rendering. And previously, we used to draw the left eye and the right eye at different points. So we drew the left eye first, then the right eye, and then we put them into uh, a texture and then drew them together. That was really bad because that caused a lot of latency. Uh, now with double wide rendering, uh, we draw them at the same time, which is really good. It avoids a lot of latency between the left and the right eye, especially when you're moving really quickly. And we also moved a lot of our VR rendering onto a separate thread. So previously it was all on the main thread, now it's on a thing called the render thread. And you can actually see that in Unity in your stats panel. So if I press play, I've got my stats. Uh, we can see here while the dinosaur runs our face is we've got our FPS and we've got uh, our latency. Uh, CPU, which is the main thread, and then here we have a render thread. So we didn't have that in 5.3. This is running one of the 5.4 betas. So we can see how much of the render thread takes off the main thread, which is really, really useful. Okay. Uh, stop doing this. So you're not J.J. Abrams, you're not making Star Trek, you're not making Star Wars. You don't need that many lens flares in your life, and neither does your players. And image effects cost a lot of processing, especially when you're drawing it twice. So yeah, image effects in VR. Certain things make sense, like vignetting, bloom, tone mapping, only very little. Uh, depth of field just does not work. We do that with our eyes by themselves. Uh, lens flare, uh, stop it. Uh, SSR, uh, it looks nice, but it's far too expensive. Uh, I think everybody who's like developing for VI, if they've got like the most powerful machine ever, they think, oh yeah, we don't need to optimize because we've got a powerful machine. That is not the case. Make sure you do. Uh, we've got various different uh, cinematic image effects on our bit bucket here that we're working on. Uh, these eventually will be in the editor, but uh, they're currently like a beta phase, but uh, we use them for our Adam demo for GDC, if you saw that. Uh, they're really, really nice. Check them out. And we have our VR standard assets and docs. So we've created these about three or four months ago, and currently they work for the Oculus and the Gear VR, uh, and the, the, the PlayStation version on our forums. Uh, we're also adapting these now for the Vive, now that's become native, and then eventually we'll do for the cardboard as well. Uh, and then there's various different documentation about uh, design techniques and doing the right things in Unity for rendering. But yeah, they're really, really useful. And one of the last things I want to tell you is this. VR doesn't work for every single thing that everybody wants to do. So stop trying to force it on everything. You don't need to be wearing a headset when you're having a, a meeting. You don't need it for certain types of games. Stop trying to force it in every way you possibly can. But at the end of the day, make sure you have lots and lots of fun. It's a new thing. It's very accessible. We've seen today how quickly you can get something up and running and working. 
so yeah, so make something awesome and, and share it with as many people as possible. And thank you very much for listening to me ramble on for an hour. <laughs>